Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 5 Consciousness Part 2 Miles underground, after the dust had settled, the three rushed over to the rubble that should have been their return trip awaiting them, preferably in better condition. There were large, jagged pieces of cement, which used to be the shaft's interior, that the elevator had forced down underneath it, laying before them. On top of the debris sat a defunct carriage that didn't even have the will to flicker green from inside any longer. The fragmented cabin that was once occupied by the three was now crushed beyond recognition. It wasn't even able to be breached through its entry. Before meeting its demise, the doors were completely shut. But now, from the intense collision, they were slightly open. Just above the cabin, as well as underneath, messy layers of more and more concrete lay wedged between each other and the elevator. The underground team tried pulling, pushing and prying the collection of broken matter to no avail. They desperately tried, reaching through cracks and crevasses throughout the mire 
attempting to place their third sense on anything remotely feeling like their missing radio. A slow descent of the impromptu mission began to take place as Seth started to observe the rest of the room that they were in. His focus was drawn to a large dome-like ceiling. Centered directly underneath was a large steel cage with curtains lining the inside partially open in the front. They had dark brown, splashy stains all over them. As he began walking towards it, compelled by pure curiosity, he suddenly realized the remains of a human body along the way. It was all skeleton, clothed in what appeared to be a tattered hazmat suit. Near the body's head sat an open briefcase with an open laptop and a darkened screen inside of it. This obviously wasn't his plan, Eugene said. He had walked up behind him while he was focused in on a lifeless figure. Seth turned his head slightly toward Eugene without shifting his eyes from the deceased human. There's two more in that cage over there. Eugene looked up to where Seth was lazily pointing. Sure enough, just beyond the open cage lay two more bodies bereft of life. They were also in tattered and tarnished hazmat-like suits. What the fuck happened down here? Trevor said, joining his two buddies, both contemplating scenarios of the long ago occurrence. They stood there for a moment, letting the eerie display carnage beg questions. What really went on here? They thought to themselves. Is it the room that killed them? There were no weapons or a sign that they turned on one another. Could they soon share the same fate of their three lifeless roommates? We gotta figure a way out of here. We obviously can't communicate with the rest of our group anymore. We need to spread out, see what we can find. Maybe there's another elevator or something. That door over there might be a good start, Seth announced as he drew the other two's attention toward a burnt door that appeared to be a shade of gray at one time. The three, completely forgetting the resourceful tip of splitting up, mentioned by Trevor just a second ago, slowly approached the door. Seth continued to talk. So much for a safe harbor. Says here, safe harbor software. A software company. We tracked down a fucking software company. The thought crossed each of their minds, but was immediately and unanimously blocked out due to the array of dark threats the thought was accompanied by. Why? Oh, why would anyone lure a group of people all the way into the jungles of South America? Some unwelcomed conclusions flashed in their heads as a much-needed distraction came about. Sonkudo Underground Laboratory, Trevor said while reading the sign he had seen earlier aloud, while letting out an annoyed sigh. And there's our zoo. The three came up to the door. It had a regular doorknob on it that clearly was able to be locked. The three hesitated for a second as Eugene looked over at his companions. Should we knock? Trevor looked back at him with a crooked expression and a frown as if to say that his humor wasn't comforting. Eugene smiled and shrugged while looking at Seth, who was just shaking his head in disappointment with a sarcastic smile. Trevor reached forward and grabbed the handle. He closed his eyes as if that would give him a better chance. He slowly turned it until they heard the inner battery assembly click into place. He looked back at the two with raised eyebrows. Slowly, he pushed the door open. Having no weapons, they were all beginning to feel a sense of unease as a very dark room began to introduce itself. Finally, after all the complaining through its slow, creaky sounds, the door stood completely wide open, only leaving them inches from the borders of the unknown. A soft humming sound slightly echoed through the curious darkness while the tiniest of red and green lights pulsated off into the distance. Eugene reached in and felt along the wall directly inside for a switch until the entire room lit up all at once. The room wasn't that big, about the size of a large walk-in closet or a small bedroom. The walls and ground maintained the same decor as the surrounding laboratory that dwarfed it. Alongside the opposite side of the room, 
was a towering shelving unit that facilitated a few large computer towers, several keyboards, a mouse, and finally, a flat computer screen monitor. Do I even have to say anything? Trevor looked over at Eugene. Eugene looked back at the two. You guys really need to learn this shit. Trevor shrugged his shoulders. We have all the time in the world now. It had been about five long hours now, without any word from below. Beck, along with Jack and Joe, could not even get the steel door open to survey the damage below. The wiring inside the black boxes to either side of the door spoke a foreign language to the three. This is where Eugene could really come in handy, but irony had him miles below instead. They had tried for hours to contact them by radio and were slowly losing hope. They had no idea if the three men beneath were even alive anymore. If they were, were they hurt? And if so, how bad? Did they make it to an opening? Were they at least able to stumble across some supplies? Without getting an answer over the radio for so long now, these questions kept persisting conclusions that drove Beck, Anne, and Jack insane. The entire surfaced party were now all inside the concrete structure, including the little ones. Jack was still fussing with the radio, seeing if maybe Trevor had inadvertently changed channels. Beck was trying her hardest to understand the wiring in the box, while Joe kept a steady light for her, illuminating her workspace. They had all agreed that the kids would be safest right now inside the enclosure while all the adults were putting their heads together, brainstorming as best they could. Caleb and Delilah were left to their imaginations, sitting quietly, facing each other, whispering war plots towards one another as they played on the sandy concrete flooring. They were at the feet of one of their many parental figures, Anne. She was watching Jack and Beck with the terrified thoughts of what may have become of her husband burrowing their way through her head. Anne heard it first. Was that the sound of helicopter blades? It was the slightest sound, but she definitely heard something. Shh. She immediately signaled to the kids playing while also receiving an audience from the other adults inside. Does anyone else hear that? Jack and Beck looked at each other. Shit, was Anne losing her mind? Jack thought to himself. But then, slowly he saw Beck's expression change. Then he looked to Joe and sure enough, he was hearing something as well. Jack still was at a loss as he asked, what is it? Then. He heard it too. The four adults ran out of the covering and all formed a line parallel to the open door behind them. They squinted as they looked up in the sky, their hands shielding their eyes from the bright skies. There, Joe yelled as he pointed. Sure enough, it was a helicopter. It was quite a way off into the distance, but appeared to be heading towards them. Joe looked over at Jack, who still had his head to the sky. With a much quieter voice, he composed his question. Expecting anyone? All the while, about two miles under the aerial sighting, a drama was still unfolding. Eugene was standing at the black and green computer screen while moving the mouse and typing code into the system's hardware. There were no chairs. Instead, they all stood while Eugene hacked away. See this here? That's the firewall. You're actually looking at code that monitors the system's entire security apparatus. I haven't actually broken into the system. The US government firewall is way too strong for that. Instead, by extrapolating these codes here, I borrowed the algorithm and created one of my own. I basically bent the code in our direction giving us limited access to the software. Now we just need a username. Eugene looked at the two. They both looked back at him with an expression that seemed to suggest they were in no mood to come up with some stupid username on the spot. Eugene continued to type as he spoke out loud. Um, okay. G, U, 
BST. Then he hit enter. The computer screen went to a bright white screen with a square in the center. Inside the square read, Welcome to Zool. Safe Harbor Software. This U.S. government system is intended for authorized users only. Then, underneath that was the warning defined in a much more legal manner, pointing to laws and federal codes. Underneath the box was a button that read, Enter. Eugene clicked on it to find the page go to a dizzying screen of laboratory records. He scanned down until happening upon an interesting title that read, Last security footage, 2033, March 9th. He clicked on it, and the entire screen went black. The three of them stared as nothing seemed to happen for several seconds. To make things worse, the computer sounded as though it had turned off. What the hell? Eugene stated, with confusion in his breath. He turned to Seth and Trevor. That's weird. I should have access to anything that I can see on the screen. We may have to reboot the system. Just then, a video began to play before them. They watched a whole long portion of nothing, just the view of an empty lab. The cage in the center, unlike what they saw for themselves just earlier, was closed by clean, white, hanging curtains. Then they saw three people enter the screen in white hazmat suits. Eugene hit the fast-forward button, skimming to anything that might help them better understand why the three people had met the tragic fate displayed outside the room they were standing in. There, exclaimed Seth. Eugene stopped fast-forwarding by pressing play. The three looked on in horror as they saw the blood-curdling images flash before their eyes. No sound came from the video, which somehow intensified the play back in a horrifying manner. Eugene stayed hunched over the screen, watching closely, while Seth leaned in right next to him. Trevor was slowly backing up, clutching the hair of his scalp with his hands. The video finally came to an end. Eugene and Seth looked over at each other, then back at Trevor, who was clearly rattled as he began speaking quickly. We gotta get the fuck out of here. What if that thing's still in here? What if it's still alive? Hold on a sec. I think I found something, Eugene said. He was back on the white screen, scrolling down the list of laboratory records. He clicked on a button that read, Laboratory Log, Specimen 7628542032, October 21st. Again, the computer appeared as though it had turned off. This time, knowing what to expect, they held their focus on the computer. A man's face finally appeared, just his face. He was standing in the room they were currently in. Only many years ago, he was silent as he appeared to be fumbling with something. Then, there was sound. He continued to mess around with something on the shelf next to the monitor he was facing. Stalked inside, then began to speak. This is Salvador Philip Channing. The date is October 21st, 2032. Time is 1,452 hours, he stated while momentarily glancing at his watch. This is my seventh time observing this specimen. He continued to speak with nervous unease of the things he had to share. We have concluded that the specimen's genome is comprised of 172 DNA molecules. The human body only has 46. While the complexity of their DNA is vastly greater than ours, it seems to be the least alarming aspect. Their brain from frontal lobe to the cerebellum measures roughly 37 centimeters, while ours averages about 15. Furthermore, upon several magnetic resonance imaging tests, it is found to use 97% of its entire brain's capacity. Through several tests, we have qualified the specimen to possess abilities such as, but not limited to, telepathy, levitation, localized teleportation, and instantaneous metamorphosis. However, the specimen is extremely weakened and cannot perform these abilities to their fullest extent. Several days ago, 
we were finally able to achieve communication with our subject through a variation of mathematical code, letter by letter. We were not able to get clear, precise answers from it, but we were able to make out a few Russian words. For instance, in the case of Entry Log 2032, October 13th, we asked if there were any others on our planet. Its response put us completely at a loss. Its answer was completely off-topic. It appeared to make no sense at all. Perhaps this is due to onset disorientation, possibly caused by pyrexia. Then again, without access to a substantial control group, we are not able to adequately establish guidelines as to what may qualify as a high fever for its species. The answer was simply Okrana Scotus. In English, this translates to cattle guards. Now, this does make some sense. If, indeed, pyrexia does play a role, it may simply be hallucinating images from its past experiences on our planet. For example, the site it was originally apprehended in was surrounded by Russian farmland. There were surely plenty of posted signs there, which it could have easily obtained those words from. We are still undergoing early phases of tests to find out more about the virus, although we do have clues leading us to the educated theories. Theory number one is that they came here with the virus. Maybe they're here in search of a cure. Oftentimes with unknown viruses, it behooves oneself to scan the heavens. A distant rock can often hold elements to unlocking useful tools to combat microscopic invaders. Our second theory suggests a much darker premise. The specimen became ill here on our planet through gestation. This theory examines a dilemma we hope not have to overcome. Upon our investigation of the originating site of Petrovka, there were absolutely no human bodies found. At the same time, nearly hundreds were wiped out. As outlandish as it may seem, we believe it is worth looking into the minute possibility that static came over the computer as the lights in the entire facility began to flicker. I think the computers are bogging down the generator, Eugene said as he looked to the other two. With a few buttons on the keyboard and a click of the mouse, the screen returned to its black and green layout as he logged out of the Zool mainframe. At that moment, all the lights in the facility stabilized, but presented a slightly dimmer shine. We don't have much time before the power completely goes out, and we may begin to lose air down here, Eugene said, alarming his two friends. Trevor's right. We need to spread out and see if we can find a backup route. Hold up, Seth interrupted with a stern voice. What do you mean, air? Eugene looked at his younger partners, noticing their disconcerted expressions, now taking hold of their faces. You guys realize we are, like, miles underground, don't you? There has to be some kind of compression unit, drawing oxygen this far down. Wherever this system is, I'm sure it's not powered by Skittles. An immediate look of logic defeated Seth and Trevor's once confused expressions. The two, along with Eugene, began twisting and turning their bodies around. They were all peering into the corners of the small room they were in, as well as the cavernous room that resided just beyond it. Trevor and Eugene began briskly walking out of the computer repository to survey their options in the main room. But Seth did not. Instead, he held a gaze below the computer they were once occupying. Then he attempted to gain the attention of his two partners. Hey, guys, Trevor and Eugene, frantically eyeballing the larger room, unintentionally ignored their would-be cellmate. Seth, still focused on his new mysterious finding, tried beckoning his buddies once more. Hey, guys, check this out. I think I've got something. Trevor and Eugene shared glances as if developing a telepathic ability of their own, without parsing words, shared the same thought. What on earth could be so important in there? We saw every inch of the room. Not much to see. Still, the two immediately doubled back as requested. 
They met Seth on either side of him, designing a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder assembly. Their minds raced as they laid their eyes on Seth's potential jackpot. Just underneath the tall shelving unit on the ground, barely exposing itself to the three aspiring escapists, was a separation in the flooring parallel to the unit. On each end, the separation angled 90 degrees and crept under the lowest ledge, apparently continuing on to form a square. Could this be a tunnel? Without even exchanging ideas of any semblance of a plan, they all began rearranging the cramped computer room to emancipate the possible exit. Once they removed enough weight, through carelessly removing items from the shelves, they slid the unit aside. Sure enough, it was something. In the dead center of the square slab, separated from the rest of the concrete flooring, was a handle. On the opposite end, nearest the wall, were what appeared to be hinges embedded along the furthest crevice. The three looked on in hopeful shock. Trevor hurriedly bent over, grabbed the handle and began to pull. He grunted at the weight, but slowly built a gap between the closest side of the lid and the floor. Upon the sight of freedom, Seth and Eugene dropped to their knees, slid their fingers between the gap and proceeded to assist their teammate. Now, all three began to grunt. Eventually, the lid started opening much faster, until finally it came to a loud slamming, resting place against the stone wall behind it. They peered into a dingy, musty, dark hole. It didn't have any stairs and was absent of a ladder. They could see with the provided light above, from the space they were currently standing in, just barely, the hint of ground below. It seemed to be about four, maybe five feet down. The three shared glances, and after slight hesitation, all agreed this was their best option. One after the other, they slipped into the depths below, not the slightest clue of what the near future would provide them with. First went Trevor, then Seth, and finally Eugene. There was a slight tumble, but nothing to shake their nerves over. The room was dark, but clearly made of the similar cement material, matching the rest of the superstructure. It was very cold, and a musty smell lay thick, permeating the tight atmosphere. Eugene hit the ground, landing just behind Seth, who was turned away from him, but facing back with a celebratory look. Eugene's gaze moved from Seth's face to the back of Trevor's head, and then, finally, beyond the two, to a dimly lit end with a red ladder ascending beyond their sights. They simultaneously raced forward, paying no attention to how silly three grown men looked, trying to run while crouching down a dark small hallway. They didn't even fight the stupid looking grins growing across their faces as they approached the ladder towards the end. In a single file, but not so orderly way, they reached their goal. The team were finally able to stand, fully erect, and observe the discovered riser room. The three were immediately overwhelmed with the amazing sight that unfolded overhead. The vertical hole was about 10 feet wide. The ladder was positioned in the dead center, not contacting the ground. Instead, at consistent, ascending intervals, it was attached to the interior cement siding with steel braces. At each one of these intervals were safety ledges, wide enough for one to rest. Each was paired with a familiar green glow of lights, fixed to the walls, just above each ledge. With just the little bit of light, they could see the daunting task that lay before them. Unable to see the ladder's end, it was still enough to see the immense distance the stairs traveled before receding into the shadows. Unable to refrain from laughing with each other, while exchanging a few fist bumps, not seconds passed before they began to make their journey up. I can't wait to get to the top. One of them cried out while they climbed their first leg. The three began to gleefully conversate as they made their way to freedom. I'm gonna drink a gallon of water. Good luck. There's not gonna be any left by the time I'm done drinking. I just can't wait to see some fucking sunlight. I wonder where this comes out should be just behind the entrance to the elevator. 
stupid piece of shit elevator. Hey, it was worth it though. Can't wait to see the look on Jack's face when we tell him about Specimen 265, whatever the fuck the numbers were. He's gonna flip his shit. Hey, we should scare the shit out of them when we get up there. Sneak up on them. The three began to laugh, imagining the thought of scaring their surfaced friends as their voices began to fade. They each began to disappear, one by one, into the darkness of the underground heavens. Little by little, the cement landing slowly became empty and silent, with no evidence of any human life. Several hours later, the morning skies had morphed into a bright, sunny, late afternoon. Within the shadows, cast by a familiar cement structure, sprawling fauna flourished in an array of mixed vegetation and weeds. A small, shadowy patch of nature suddenly came alive, as if from a disturbance from underneath its soil, an unnatural motion overtook the grassy area. Soon, a distinctly circular mixture of dirt and plants began to shift upward as a metal lid began to take form. A hand began to appear, shortly followed by Trevor's squinted face. Although protected by the shade of the elevator's home, the bright sky still heavily affected his ability to see. He began to heft himself up and over the side of the deep well. He then scooted back on his rear and withdrew his legs and doubled over the hole, offering a hand to the next in line. Seth threw up his hand and caught Trevor's as the two pulled on each other, rushing Seth to the surface. They both then turned around and helped Eugene complete his ascent. The three stood in a circle, at least the best circle three could make, triumphantly looking down into the dark, conquered void. Again, they smiled at each other and proceeded to seek a well-deserved reunion with their friends. They began to walk, making their way around the corner of the small building. They assumed that their estranged companions were still seeking tactics of rescue within the structure itself. Not knowing the reactions of their soon-to-be surprised friends, they all reserved a proud smile. It was Trevor who saw it first. Joe was laying on the ground, about 30 feet from where the escaped three were appearing from. He knew what he was seeing. He just didn't want to come to grips with it. A bloody mess crowned the back end of Joe's lifeless body. A man in a Hawaiian-like shirt was faced away from Trevor, standing to the left of Joe's remains. Opposite and facing him were Kent, Ash, and Samel. Three men gained a sense of seriousness as they noticed the group coming from around the enclosure. Kent immediately raised an assault rifle at the incoming threesome. This sudden change of emotional tempo flushed Trevor's veins to an icy cold temperature. There was also this change that cued the man in the Hawaiian shirt to spin around and look at Trevor. It was Paco. As he turned, everything seemed to be in slow motion for Trevor. He saw his gramps now come into view, kneeled before his captor, hands behind his back. Trevor noticed, just beyond Paco, right outside the plane, sat the remaining four, bound and gagged. Trevor's completely heartbroken and shocked face refocused on his grandfather. Jack slowly raised his head and looked at Trevor. He mouthed, to Trevor, I'm sorry, Tiger. Paco stood next to him with a handheld gun in his right hand, pointed at Jack's head. He had the biggest smile on his face as Trevor tried to say something, but no words came out. Paco kept his smiling stare right on Trevor. Never mind, Jack. I found them. With that, Trevor watched the bullet enter his grandfather's skull as blood splattered the men surrounding him. Trevor dropped to his knees as his two friends on either side caught him from completely falling to his face. Through all the tears and ringing in his ears, he could barely see or hear Paco approaching him. A very thick Hispanic accent began to echo his entire being. Trevor? Trevor? Snap out of it, amigo. We got some fun stories to tell you. Plus, he added, while still walking up to the three, huddled to the ground. 
He came to a knee and leaned into Trevor's ear and gently whispered, Plus, we have some wonderful new cages to show you.